Okay, good morning to all of you. Uh, students online, good morning. Am I audible? You know, uh, there's one camera on. If you can just give me a thumbs up in case you can hear me. Online? Online student? Cool. Yeah, so every I am audible. So a warm welcome to all of you, even as we start off with Old Testament survey. Um, just to begin with a brief introduction, you know, today we would just look at uh, what the Hebrew original Bible, uh, how it was composed, what it, um, uh, some of the facts regarding that. So we'll just look very briefly at that. Now, next class onwards would be your actual, um, you know, uh, sessions. So today is more like an introduction. All right. Uh, so we will uh, get into that without any further delay. Um, now, uh, the Old Testament, as most of us know, was originally written in the Hebrew language. Uh, the um, Israelite people, uh, they used to communicate in the Hebrew language. So that was the language in which uh, all the Old Testament books were written down. And um, right at the beginning, you know, uh, probably it was um, the, the things which were being taught by the Lord were probably being conveyed in an oral manner, you know, because uh, in those days there was not much writing being done. Uh, it was um, more... Uh, it is more of an oral tradition where people would almost memorize large chunks of teaching and then they would convey it to uh, their listeners. So originally, right in the beginning, um, Moses would have started off that kind of a tradition where he would be um, conveying large pieces of uh, teaching and uh, you know, the people who are with him would learn that they would memorize it they would pass it on to other people so in the very initial stages uh, they would have been uh, uh, a memory a mem memorization of genealogies they would memorize you know the the songs and poems which are there in the book of genesis and uh, slowly at some point of time when uh, the people had settled down you know and things were more um, um, sedentary and they were settled down in one place at that point of time Moses would have started putting it down in writing, uh, the, the things, you know, which the Lord has been revealing. So uh, the oral tradition is what would have been there right in the beginning. Uh, and then at some point of time, the writing onto scrolls would have started. Uh, so uh, when we look at our Old Testament, it's, uh, if, you look, if you look at the original uh, um, Bible, the Old Testament, it's all in Hebrew except for four uh, portions, four passages, which are actually in the Aramaic language. Uh, now, this was um, much later um, in, the, in, in the period after the exile and all of that, uh, by which time Hebrew was kind of on the way out. It was still very well known. People were still understanding Hebrew, but Aramaic, a language called Aramaic, very similar to Hebrew, was um, becoming the lingua franca. You know, this is the language the people were uh, used to, the, the language that people were um, communicating with on a daily basis. So there are four passages in our Old Testament which are actually written in the Aramaic language and the rest of it, of course, is in the uh, Hebrew language. So uh, just for those of us you know, who may be interested in knowing about that, uh, Genesis 31, 47 has an Aramaic word used in it. And uh, then you have Ezra chapter 4, um, verse 18, all the way up to chapter 6, where you have a decree being made by a king. Now, that passage also is in the uh, Aramaic language. And um, Daniel chapter 2, uh, and then up to uh, chapter 7, at which time uh, Daniel was living in Persia, where Aramaic was very commonly spoken. So that passage also is in the Aramaic language rather than in the uh, Hebrew language. And this one, uh, the fourth passage is an interesting, um, it's just one verse actually, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11, uh, which is written in Aramaic, almost as though the Lord was very particular that this particular verse should be understood by everyone you know whether they are hebrew people or whether they are people belonging to other nations and so this jeremiah 10 11 um maybe one of us seated here you know in our uh, class over here physical class 
could probably just read out. And for those of you who are online, if you could just turn to Jeremiah 10, 11, uh, why was the Lord so particular that this particular verse should be written in the Aramaic language, which would be understood by all the nations of that time? Uh, uh, and if one of us could just read out Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11. Yeah, uh, for those of us online who have been following in our Bibles, Jeremiah 10, uh, verse 11, it talks about how our Lord is sovereign. And the Lord was declaring that all these other um, entities that these people are worshipping, they would one day be uh, no longer even remembered, or people would not even uh, worship them any longer. But the Lord would remain forever because he is the living God. And uh, the Lord stirred Jeremiah to present this one single verse in the Aramaic language so that everyone would have a very, very clear idea of what the living God was saying to the nations. So um, coming to the way the Hebrew Bible was composed. Now, some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, the Hebrew Bible is divided into three main sections. Now, when the English translation was done, uh, we have rearranged the books in a particular order because uh, the English translators wanted to make it more chronological. So they tried to present the books in a chronological manner. But then if you look at the original uh, Hebrew Bible, they had three main divisions. And um, maybe we could look at the PowerPoint for that. Sorry, I seem to be unable to share this. Right. So there are three main divisions for our uh, Hebrew Old Testament. The first is called the Torah. And that's the mo most familiar one, you know, which most of us are familiar with. The word Torah basically means instruction. So uh, the first five books were instructions given by the Lord to Moses. And uh, that would basically be from Genesis to Deuteronomy. The second main section of the Hebrew Old Testament is what they call the Nevi'im. Now the Nevi'im, the word Nevi'im basically means prophets. And so uh, you have uh, um, prophetic books which come under that particular section. And the last section was called the Ketuvim. The word Ketuvim basically means writings. And that includes some of the historical books and also some of the other um, um, books. Now, um, in this Ketuvim, the third section, there was one particular section. Uh, there were some subsections. Okay? Ketuvim was one of the third main sections. But under the Ketuvim, there were some um, two to three minor sections uh, into which this particular major section was divided. And um, yeah, just, um, just a minute, please, because I just want to show that. So one of the main sections in this third part, Ketuvim, was called the Megiloth. And they were five major scrolls. Now, these five major scrolls were used on special occasions during festivals, uh, where they would stand in the temple and publicly read out these particular portions. Uh, so they were called the Megiloth, and um, that should show up in the next slide. If you could just hold on a minute, please. Right. So the second slide. OK, so the second slide. There are three subsections for the second, um, for the third section, the Ketuvim. 
sorry, just minor adjustments will uh, get organized as the days go by. Um, I'll just continue, all right? Um, well, all right. Uh, yeah. So the Megillot, the five scrolls, are basically your Song of Songs and the Book of Ruth. And then you have Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. And it's interesting for which particular festivals each of these was read out. So um, yes, thank you so much. Yeah. So the Song of Songs was basically used at the time of the Passover, when the when you know that, that was basically the festival you choose to attract the largest number of people. People would travel from all over Israel and come to the temple because the Passover was considered a very important feast. It was a reminder to them of what the Lord had done for them, where he passed over their homes and protected them from the judgment and wrath of God. Uh, so it was a very significant feast for them. And at that particular feast, it was the Song of Songs which was read out. It was that particular scroll which was read out uh, because it was a reminder to them that this God Almighty, you know, who is above for all, chose to um, chose to partner with them, chose to form a covenant with them. You know, just a very small nation of people, not a great powerful kingdom, just an ordinary bunch of people who were living as slaves in a land. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords chooses to enter into a covenant with them. And uh, almost it's, it is almost as like a marriage covenant. He has chosen to be faithful to them generation after generation. So at the Passover festival, they would read out this. Now, at that time, they were still not aware of the um, overall complete significance of the Passover, because only in the New Testament, we get to know who the Passover lamb is. But even at that time, they had a small appreciation of what this King of Kings has chosen to do for them by choosing to enter into a covenant relationship with them. So they would read out that. And then the book of Ruth. Now, that was read out during the Feast of Weeks. And um, uh, then you have, uh, it's, which is also called Pentecost. That would be the Feast of Pentecost. All right. So Ruth was read out at the Feast of the Pentecost. And then you have uh, uh, the book of Lamentations, uh, which was like a reminder of uh, how the, you know Jerusalem had uh, um, fallen and um, that was read out on the day of atonement and of course we have Ecclesiastes which was read out uh, at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles and Esther, Esther we know right if you look at the very last verse of Esther where it talks about how this Feast of Purim was started it was a reminder to the people that even though they were living in a heathen nation away from the protection of their own land the Lord was faithful to them and he protected them and took care of them. Uh, so, um, so the Megaloth were considered very important and uh, the entire crowd would stand there and listen respectfully, even as these scrolls were read out during the time of those particular festivals. Now, uh, moving on to the next slide. So if you look at the arrangement of the Hebrew Old Testament, you have the Torah, and then you have the Nevi'im, the prophetic books, and then you have the Ketuvim, which are the writings. And in the ordering of the books which they had, the last one would be Chronicles. Now, of course, in the English Bible, we have split Chronicles into First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. But then for them at that time, it was just one large scroll of Chronicles. And uh, we see references to this arrangement of the Old Testament in the in in uh, things which Jesus said. For instance, when we look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, uh, where the Lord says, Upon you will come the righteous blood, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, where the Lord is talking about how the people have become hard-hearted and um, they have uh, uh, chosen to murder the messengers who were sent to them. And uh, so with reference to that, the Lord speaks about the first murder which happened in the book of Genesis, which obviously would be the uh, death of Abel. And he talks about the last murder mentioned in the Old Testament. If you're thinking about that arrangement of books, where Chronicles would be the last one. 
and so he talks about Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who was murdered. Even as he goes towards the altar for shelter, they literally come there and they murder him right there near the altar. So uh, the Lord uh, talks about this particular arrangement of the Old Testament books when he's uh, talking, you know, when he's speaking in this particular verse. Um, coming to the next reference, um, I'm not sure whether I've included it in the slide. Oh, I have not. Okay. The other reference would be Luke uh, 24, 27, where uh, it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So over there, the term Moses and beginning with Moses, it's talking about the Torah and, and all the prophets that's talking about the Nevi'im. So using the Torah and the Nevi'im and of course the writings which follow that, the Lord explains this is how the Messiah is described and this is how he is explained in the Old Testament. So we see that the arrangement of the original Hebrew Bible was different from the uh, English uh, arrangement of books which we see today. Now uh, just to... Um, talk about some other things which are there in our um, uh, textbook. Now, uh, the printed copy of the Old Testament survey, you would probably receive it uh, maybe next class. All right. So uh, that just has a brief introduction. And um, uh, for, for those who are online, that has, I think, already been posted. So you'll probably have access to that already. All right. Uh, so there's just a brief mention of something called the Samaritan Pentateuch in, in, in the intro, which is there in the textbook. So just to talk about what exactly is a Samaritan Pentateuch. Um, now, uh, at the time of the exile, when the okay, I need to keep track of my time as well. Could I have one person who can help me in this? Uh, we would need to finish at 11.50. So at 11.40, if someone could just kind of, you know, uh, wave at me so that uh, we can have 10 minutes for uh, questions and uh, the online students can post your questions uh, in the chat. And uh, because of the PowerPoint, which is running, I may not be able to see it right away. Uh, but what we would do each class without fail is that uh, I would go through all the questions which have been posted online, and I will also take note of the questions which are being you know, mentioned here in the class. If we cannot cover them within 10 minutes, uh, that's all right. We will make sure that those questions are addressed in the next class. All right. So all your uh, doubts and clarifications uh, will be uh, taken care of. Uh, but let us restrict our questions to specifically whatever uh, you know, we are discussing in our particular class. Uh, there would be other occasions when you will be able to voice your questions regarding the other things. Uh, but uh, let's stick to whatever has been discussed on that particular day for that particular class. So at um, uh, 40, yeah, at 11.40, if someone can you know, kindly wave at me so that I would stay on track. All right, so just coming back to this term Samaritan Pentateuch, what exactly is the, who exactly were the Samaritans? Again, we, some of us, you know, we have a background knowledge of this already. Uh, at the time of the exile, uh, most of the people of Judah were taken away as exiles to Babylon. And uh, while they were living over there, uh, they, um, some other people were, were shifted to live in the land of Israel. Um, the, the international policy of the Babylonians was that they would um, mix and mingle all the uh, people groups so that they would lose their national identity and they would no longer think of themselves as you know uh, being israelites or uh, think of themselves as edomites but they would all think of themselves down the line as babylonians so while the israelite people were moved out of their nation and taken to a far off place some people from other places were brought and resettled in the land of israel and they began to call themselves Samaritans because they were in the surrounding area of Samaria. And uh, so uh, they picked up some of the things which the Israelites had been following up to that point. So they were aware of the Torah. Uh, but only thing when they got their hands on the Torah scroll, they took the freedom to change it 
uh, and you know add all kinds of extra things to it so they retain one version of the pentateuch you know what they call the first five penta basically means five so the first five books uh, so they did retain the original to some extent but there were many many changes made to the uh, original torah so that began to be called the samaritan pentateuch and uh, we have copies one or two manuscripts of that even existing today i mean even today in some museum somewhere uh, it's out there for display so um, that's the samaritan pentateuch um the other uh, important term would be septuagint now again this is a term which many um, bible students are now familiar with uh, but for those of us who you know have not been paying too much attention to our greek and latin and all that because we have you know more uh, uh, important things to do uh, so the word septuagint basically is talking about 70 because um, like i said hebrew was becoming an old language which people were not really familiar with anymore aramaic came along aramaic also began to fade though it remained as a kind of um, common everyday language but not really used so much in scholarly circles and uh, greek began to take over so when greek began to take over uh, the the leaders the spiritual leaders were concerned they were worried that a lot of people no longer can even understand when the hebrew scroll is read out to them that's that language sounds ancient and they don't even understand what is being read out and so uh, the the leaders decided that they would uh, uh, translate the entire old testament into the greek language and there were 70 elders who came together to do the translation that is why you have the word scepter which basically means 70. So you have the Septuagint. So the Septuagint was the um, Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And this was done probably, they probably finished compiling that by maybe around 300 years before the birth of Christ. So even long before the birth of Christ, there was already a Greek translation of the Old Testament in existence. And in the New Testament, you see Jesus referring to it a few times you know rather than quoting from the hebrew he quotes uh, he quotes from the septuagint translation because sometimes there is a slight variation in which the translation was done and you see jesus quoting from the septuagint rather than from the hebrew text so uh, it was something which was accepted uh, widely accepted by most people now the other significant thing in your uh, introduction in your textbook uh, would be regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls. Again, now that has become a very familiar term and most of us know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. Um, now, it was, I think, in 1947 that someone discovered the scrolls in a cave. Uh, there was this person who, uh, a shepherd boy, who was tending to his sheep and he accidentally uh, came across those caves in which he saw these tall uh, clay jars store with, filled with all these ancient scrolls. And uh, so then it was discovered that entire passages of the Old Testament were written down. And all the critics who had been you know, very busy criticizing in the early 1900s saying, oh, this Old Testament has existed since so many generations. I'm sure it's been completely modified by all the generations as it was coming down. Uh, and uh, so now who knows whether the original text is even there or not, whether what Moses really wrote back then really exists or not. Maybe somebody modified it along the way. And they had all these people who were criticizing. But then when these scrolls came to light, and many of these scrolls, you see, were written before the birth of Christ. They were copies which had been written down, handwritten, before the, uh, the birth of Christ. And almost word by word, exactly it's the same, uh, you know, which um, the, the same wording which is there in our Bibles today, which means nobody tampered with the uh, Old Testament, even though so many generations had passed, people were extremely careful in maintaining the integrity of the Old Testament. And uh, they made copies and kept them in those tall jars, even before the birth of Christ. And uh, that same uh, text came down into the New Testament times and also came down through the ages. And so what we have in our current Bible matches with scrolls which were found uh, which were written down even before the time of Jesus' birth. So uh, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are important because of that. It shows, it proves that 
uh, no tampering was ever done, more, no modifications were ever done in, uh, you know, when they were making copies of the uh, Old Testament. Coming down to another um, thing that we can maybe look at, uh, we still have some time. Um, something called the Masoretic Text. Uh, uh, and um, again, your textbook refers to this, so maybe we can just briefly touch upon it. Now, when the, when the Hebrew people began to write down the Old Testament, they did not make use of any vowels in their writing. You know, when we have our English uh, letters um, uh, and sentences and words, we use um, vowels. We use A, E, I, O, U, which helps us to pronounce the words in a particular way. Now, uh, back then, when the Hebrew Bible was being written by Moses and uh, uh, Joshua and all the others, when they were writing, they just simply wrote the main alphabets without putting any vowel marks. Um, so just for, for you to understand that, you know, I just put the words C and T, or you know, from the English alphabet over there. Now, how on earth would you pronounce C and T? I could say cat, and it would, you know, gain a certain meaning. On the other hand, I could say caught, and then it would have a totally different meaning. On the other hand, it could even be the verb cut. So it is so important. Uh, if you, if there is no vowel over there, that word could be just about anything, and you could probably pronounce it any way. Uh, so. As in the uh, in in the Old Testament times, you know, uh, very very regularly they would read out the scrolls, and the people who are listening to it again and again would know when a particular word is being read out. They would know that those particular alphabets are referring to that particular word because someone is verbally saying out those particular passages. But as time began to pass by, and many of the, and many of the common people do not even know the Hebrew language anymore, and they're all speaking Aramaic in their homes, and it's Greek which is being spoken out in the uh, you know scholarly uh, circles and all of that. And Hebrew is no longer known. The Masoretic people are a group of uh, um, uh, spiritual leaders who became very concerned. They said the people don't seem to even know what is contained in the scrolls anymore because they do not know the correct way to pronounce because there are no vowels mentioned. And so they decided we need to introduce vowels into the Hebrew scrolls. But if you start rewriting the scrolls, what if there's a mistake? What if somebody writes it down wrongly? What if they make a wrong copy of it? That would be uh, literally meddling with the words of God himself. It's a very serious thing. And so they decided when we are when we were going through the scrolls and putting in the vowels, we will not meddle with the original wording at all. All we will do is we will add some dots and dashes and markings above, below, in the side, but we will not touch the original wordings which are there in the scrolls. They were that careful about how they added the uh, vowel pointings, as they are called today. And uh, so basically you have the, you know, you have... Um, two different words mentioned over here on your screen. And um, it's basically the same alphabets. If you look at the two words, the very same alphabets, you have a, you have a, and you have the. But the markings which are there under the alphabets and the markings which are there above, they will tell you how to pronounce that a, a, and the. And depending on how you're pronouncing it, they're two very different words. So. They did that. They, they, so these things came to be called as the Hebrew vowel pointings, where they added things uh, above, below, in the side to show what exactly this word is and how it is to be pronounced. But they did not meddle at all with the original wording which had been written down in the manuscripts. Uh, so this uh, made it easy for the future generations to know how these things should be read. And uh, that actually is just a photograph of one of the um, original manuscripts. So it's called the Leningrad Codex. And this contains almost the entire Old Testament. This particular manuscript is a handwritten manuscript which someone has you know, actually very patiently written down, copied. And that particular copy is complete. And um, um, 
it was found it was discovered around 1008 ad yeah and uh, it contains the entire old testament so that's that leningrad this particular scroll so when you see when we think of scroll we just think of one, one sheet of paper but obviously when uh, we are talking about uh, pages which were handwritten pages which were stitched together okay so there were these would be pages which were stitched together um and uh, they were called as papyri papyrus books or stuff you know something like that so this was the leningrad codex and um, um this also uh, you know is um, when we look at when we compare it with our modern bibles we see that there are no variations a lot of care was taken so that uh, what we have in our hands today is the original uh, manuscript uh, moving on to the next thing now you might have heard how there are discussions on how exactly the word yahova should be pronounced and uh, so when the masoretes the masoretic people when they were uh, putting in the vowel pointings they did it for all the words except for this one word you know where uh, uh, for this which is basically your alphabets y h w and h now how do you pronounce that they felt that the word the 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 name of god is too sacred to be said out loud okay so they refused to put pointings for that so now today nobody really knows what the original um no it's, it's it's like cat cut and pot so how would you say ya her word and how do, would you say ye he wo ha or would you say yo he we he i mean you can put we don't know what vowels were there how exactly that but original name of god was sounded out how it was pronounced so what they did uh, finally was that uh the masoretes they did not want to put in the original uh, uh, and in fact many of them were not even no longer familiar with it because for generations no one was speaking out this particular word so they took the word adonai you know which is there and uh, down below in the second line that would be a uh, the and na uh, so they took the vowel pointings of adonai and they attached those same vowel pointings to the ya ha wa ha that's how you we end, end up with that pronunciation of yehova but then you know um, that's actually the vowel pointings of adonai that's not the vowel pointings of the original name of god which we will only know when we go to heaven so uh, yeah um, that's just regarding the name of god and the respect that they want to show to the name of god um all right let's get fine now um um all right so maybe we can um, Yeah, as there are there any questions at all here in the physical class and then i'll ask the same question to those of you who are online um yeah um i think there are some questions posted here okay um so yeah um i'll deal with the questions which are you know being uh, given here in the class and uh, those of you who put put down your questions in the chat uh, i will look at every single one of them and they will be addressed either you know uh, if not today at least in the next class okay so uh, yeah those of us who are here present physically uh, are there any questions that you would like to ask yes but you need to be a bit loud because i have the noise of uh, my voice and the fan and all of that just be a bit loud yeah regarding the confusion i'm a little hard of hearing very sorry i yeah if someone you know could uh, just repeat what he said or maybe it's just the fan which kind of scatters your voice and it doesn't come through it was something to do with the septuagint something to do with the elders but beyond that i could not figure out actually they said 72 of them who sat uh, tradition says that they went to say 72 separate rooms and sat down and each of them did a translation and then they came and compared with each other how they had done the translation and then they would have you know Uh, mixed and matched, just to make sure that the correct words are used 
as they are doing the translation. So, um, so it was not just a few people who just sat and just did it at one stretch. This was done very carefully. It was done separately by each person. Then they got together and they discussed which would be the best way to translate every single phrase and sentence so that accuracy would be maintained. So it's technically 72 people who they say who did it, uh, translation work. Any Anything uh, else? Any other questions? Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, if, if there are no other questions, this may be uh, just a little bit extra that I can fit in in the time that we have. Uh, I was, uh, you know, looking through a lot of material, you know, even as I was just preparing for this introduction. And um, there was this one uh, write-up which I saw, which I liked. I liked the way they kind of um, uh, talked about the Old Testament. They divided the Old Testament, you know, into uh, four portions and talked about how these four portions of the Old Testament reflect Christ. So this is what they said. Uh, the law, according to them, lays down the foundation for Jesus Christ. The historical books provide the preparation for Jesus Christ. The poetic books, they express a deep aspiration and desire for this Christ who is going to come one day. And you have the prophetic books, which talk about the expectation of this coming Christ. And it made a lot of sense to me because when we look at the Old Testament in this way, uh, you know, uh, and we divided it into these four categories, we and we and we really look at these four sections through the you know through the lens of this particular kind of classification. It makes sense uh, because when you look at the first five books, they literally lay the foundation for Christ right in our Genesis. You know, where um, there's a there's a word spoken, and it talks about how uh, one day you know. Someone will come and they will crush the the the, the serpent's head. So um, right from that time onwards, it's like as if a foundation is being laid. And then uh, as we go into uh, you know Exodus and Leviticus, it talks about the different sacrifices and all these sacrifices are towards the Christ. So the law, the first five books, really are laying down a foundation for uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, when we come to the historical books, in what way would we say that these historical books are a preparation for Jesus Christ? Um, it, maybe we could um, you know, look at a few passages. Uh, when we look at the uh, book of Joshua, it talks about how uh, this kind of slave nation who didn't even have a land of their own, and then they become a wandering nation who are wandering through the desert, they finally come into a place which they can call their own and so now historically they have a place which they can call their own place and uh, that would be the first step in the preparation of a messiah who would come one day because when the messiah comes in he, there is a place already established there's a nation which can proclaim his name there are people who you know who have already uh, they set um, uh, customs and structures and and economy and everything in place so uh, when we look at the historical books, you have the kings, you know, who come one by one, and and all along, step by step, there's an entire nation being prepared and set so that one day the Messiah, when he is born, there's already a structure already ready in place. So the historical books uh, reflect that. And um, uh, coming to the poetic books, they express an aspiration, a desire for a Messiah. Uh, and uh, in what sense do I mean that? Uh, if we look at the poetic books, we have uh, Job. You know, in Job, we have uh, one passage. Um, it's Psalm 110, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 110, verses 1 to 2, uh, where, uh, you know, Job is expressing... Oh, so sorry, I'm looking at the Psalm passage and I'm talking about Job. Very sorry. Uh, yeah. In Job, we have chapter 16, verses 20 to 21, uh, where you have Job crying out, and he says, Oh, that one might plead for a man with God, as a man pleads for his neighbor. So he says, I wish we could have a, 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 an, an, an intermediary, wish we could have a mediator, you know, 
where we can stand in front of this almighty god who is just too powerful to even stand in front of and this mediator would mediate for us with this almighty god who is unapproachable so job expresses this aspiration this longing for a christ who can come and stand in the gap for mere human beings because we cannot stand in front of god on our own and uh, yeah now coming to psalm 110 uh, 1 to 2 in uh, in this in, you know in this particular passage it talks about um, the lord says to my lord sit at my right hand until i make your enemies a foot stone and uh, so over here it talks about how the lord will extend your mighty scepter from zion how you will rule over your enemies all those things are mentioned so in the psalms there is an aspiration of one day uh, a messiah who will come who will gain um, uh, dominance and sovereignty over not just this little nation of israel but over all of the nations and he will rule so there's an as aspiration there's a desire being expressed for this future messiah if you look at ecclesiastes ecclesiastes is a very interesting and lovely book uh, you know where it uh, uh, he, he says nothing seems to be making sense this world it seems to just be going at random and however hard we work whatever we do in the end nothing seems to come out of it it all just seems to go away why what is the meaning of it and then down the line you would have a messiah who would come and would who would be able to explain the meaning of life you see that becomes a uh, that that picture becomes clearer once you bring christ into the center of our human life otherwise it's true we live we work hard and then we go what is the point of it all but yes there is a savior there is a christ who brings meaning to even the slightest smallest things which go on in our lives so the aspiration for this christ is expressed again and again in the uh, uh, poetic books and of course coming to the prophetic books you have lots of prophecies about this coming christ about uh, where he will come which place he would come to what he would achieve in what way he would die all of those things are uh, mentioned in our prophetic uh, books for that just to keep track of the time we are having we are almost out of time uh, just a moment Yeah, there are no uh, questions posted over there um anything else that you would like to ask or otherwise we can maybe just fit in a few <laughs> in the few minutes that we have left um or okay fine maybe we can cover this later uh, just a word regarding the assignments um there would be no exam as in you're not going to by heart something and come and write it down so there would be no exam but there would be four uh, uh, assignments or assessments depending on how you would like to you know phrase that uh, the first two would be rather simple in the sense all you got to do is look at the options given you know multiple choice and just put a tick mark against that the other two would require a little effort uh, because you know you're in the first year you have newly joined uh, so um, the idea is not to overtax you right in the beginning so the first two assessments uh, would be very simple all you would have is multiple choice questions and you would give your answer the next two assessments would be uh, uh, an assignment where you would have to submit some written work so it would be the same for the online students and for the people in the physical class uh, you would all have the same uh, assignment uh, it would involve a little bit of uh, maybe online research as in you would have to hunt around and gather some information and um, uh, so uh, all of these four of them four assessments would be 25 marks each so um, nobody needs to do badly you know there are some who are just naturally inclined for academic work and they tend to excel in all of that uh, but then there are some who are not really inclined towards that uh, but you cannot question their passion for the lord or for the word of god so even they can do well because the first two will just be you say 50 marks you know you can just score very very easily coming to the other 50 25 25 even there you can do quite well uh, simply because it's not going to be all that technical and difficult you would just have to gather information put it down in a neat format uh, so that there's a nice flow of thought and you would get your marks all right so um, uh, because it's uh, it's divided into four separate assessments uh, all of us can score all of us can do well yeah, nobody would have to you know suffer due to this all right 
so um, I think yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, now the the two written ones would be two weeks. Um, you would have a time of two weeks. From the time of posting, there would be two weeks for submission. At, at the end of two weeks, the uh, deadline would you know come through. Uh, as for the uh, multiple choice, it would it would just be one week. You would need to answer it by one week. And I think they are actually out of time. So uh, thank you so much, online students, uh, for uh, attending and being part of the class. In the future classes, if you have any uh, doubts, questions, clarifications, you know you can please post them in our uh, in the chat. And uh, those of you who have been here in the physical class, thank you. It's uh, helpful to be able to see people in front of your eyes. Just makes it easier because you get to you know uh, see the responses. So thank you so much, and uh, we'll have our next class next week.